We have the pleasure of welcoming William Team Top today to our interview series Leaders Hum. I'm Ashwarya Jain from the People Hum team. Before we begin, just a quick intro of People Hum. People Hum is an end-to-end, one-view integrated human capital management automation platform. The winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for HCM that is specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work with AI and automation technologies. We run the People Hum blog and video channel which receives upwards of 200,000 visitors a year and publish around two interviews with well-known names globally every month. And now for our guest, William Tapp is a very well-known name as a writer, speaker, advisor and a lot more in the HR industry. He is the president of the RecruitingDaily.com. He also hosts a podcast series. He's written over 200 HR articles, spoken at over 150 HR and recruiting conferences and conducted over 1,000 HR podcasts. He has been recognized as one of the most influential HR leaders in the world by a lot of internationally renowned websites. Welcome, William. It's thrilled to have you. Wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for asking me. Our pleasure, William. So, William, tell us a little about your work at the RecruitingDaily.com and what keeps you motivated, you know? What, what is it that makes you jump out of your bed every day? <laughs> well, well, right now, uh, right, what makes me jump out of my bed right now is, uh, is getting my kids to, the, uh, to their classes on time in the living room. So, uh, so that's what gets me out of bed. Work-wise, work raise, Recruiting Daily is a, a recruiting, it's a thing of a, all things talent. So if you're hiring or you're sourcing or recruitment marketing, uh, even HR, there's a lot of HR content. It's a, it's a community for people that hire. So it's been around for a decade. Um, I was specifically brought in uh, four years ago to help with the events business, to help them build online events and offline events and uh and that's actually been a fun experiment too to figure out how do you how do you take a an online community that thrives and then do something local like in a city you know in their neighborhood if you will and so that's been actually kind of a fun you know right now during uh, covid uh, obviously no one's leaving their house but we're still having virtual events so you know, it's it's just kind of changed the idea of what is an event. But in short, um, you know, I help, you know, with um, the community itself. And I answer a lot of questions from practitioners about vendors. And I talk to vendors uh, and do demos uh, of a lot of software. So my days kind of consist of, I'd say, probably half and half at this point where I'm talking to practitioners about what's going on, what technologies they're using, what they're not using, et cetera. And then half the time I'm talking with uh, the technology vendors, mostly marketers or product or, or uh, the C-suite on what they're doing with their products. So, you know, I kind of sit at that intersection between what you do with people and technology. I'm spending even more time talking to practitioners um, than, than, than before because a lot of there's just so much uncertainty and, um, and, you know, people, you know, maybe their budgets got cut, maybe uh, they lost their position, um, et cetera. And so really kind of when you're, when you're in your community like that, at that point, your job changes. And uh, the, the, the job is how do you help people? How do you make sure that people know that they're loved? Uh, how, do you, how do you help people through and maybe get to their next gig, um, et cetera? Long-winded answer, but uh, but but thank you for asking. Right, that, that's wonderful, William. And you know, um, now that we're into this pandemic, and suddenly uh, we're seeing like tools are uh, helping us uh, stay connected with each other, right? So you know, there are these human resources platforms and all kinds of human resources platforms, right? So what do you think, you know, which is that platform which is going to kind of stand out now? And do you think there are certain features and platforms that are going to really, really help uh, in the future after the COVID is done? Yeah, I think you can kind of break it up into maybe three things is uh, one is uh, everything video related, right? So you and I are using Zoom and we would have probably use Zoom before COVID. Um, because I had a, I've used Zoom for, for a number of years. Um, if not that, we would have used Skype or we would have used GoToWebinar or we would use some other type of technology to look at each other and shoot a video. Um, 
However, in the recruiting space, video has been kind of a video interviewing tool. And now with everyone working remotely or working from home, video, you can see the proliferation of video in a way of maybe intended or unintended consequences of like our unintended uses of now people are using video all the time for everything uh, because we want to see each other just as if we were in the office um, or, or if we're collaborating on a project, um, we want to be able to talk to each other, which is normal, and that's a phone call, but we also want to be able to see each other. So you can do that through a lot of different technologies, but I think video interviewing be, would be one category of software that a lot of people are using, not just for interviewing, but they're using it for all kinds of other collaboration. Um, learning. So any of the learning platforms that are out there that have content or that can you can create content, I think learning platinums are even more important now than they were before. And so you, historically, you'd probably look at that as category-wise as the LMS, right? Well, that's fine if you want to kind of use that, that terminology, but just think of like anything training, anything learning, and then think of not just that content of what can be consumed, but also what can they share and how can they interact with the video in, in that way and how can they interact with the content. There's one thing we're gonna, that, we're gonna, that we have learned already is that people have a little bit more downtime or they're maybe not as productive as they want to be or, or could be, if you will. And so they're using that some of that time to train. Which is which is a good thing. It's not a bad thing, actually. Um, but that that then puts the pressure on us to make sure that we have a great learning system and also great learning content. Um, and then I think, lastly, or mm, the third category I'd probably highlight is things that foster remote work. So any of the systems that you have, uh, any of the HR systems from sourcing the outplacement, how do you how do, how does that help you remotely? And, and, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, your payroll, uh, compensation, success, succession software, performance software, like all of that suite of software, how does that foster more, you know, home related or work from home related activities? So, um, you know, if you, if you have software and maybe it's not as great, it's hard or it's, you know, it's something that's, you person can explain it at the office, like, okay, they sit down and go, okay, yeah, go through this, click that, do the, now at home, you can't do that. So how do you kind of get to the point where you can make it easy on people? So you hire a new employee and they're never, they're not going to go to the office. Okay. So and that's, that's happening pretty much every day right now is we hire, we interview, we assess, we hire, and then we onboard. And in onboarding, you know, it used to be at one point, uh, especially with kind of traditional at, at work employees, that we would do the onboarding phase and take them through, you know, all the different legal, take them through, you know, all the different policies and things like that. All and and all that stuff's relevant. You still got to do all that stuff. How do you do it virtually? How do you do it, you know, in a way that you, you know, you're not going to be standing next to the person. So I, I think that those are the three things that I, the three kind of larger categories that I'd look at is, you know, how does video help your business and how does video foster, you know, teamwork and culture, collaboration, um, learning, training, development, software, content how does that help your staff how does that help everybody on the team and then all technologies really broad anything that helps you with remote work now during covid uh, during the pandemic and then after the pandemic i think it's also important to kind of think of life after the pandemic um, in in a positive way of okay how has this affected us you know how not just the uh, you know, immediate things that, that are affecting us, but how does it affect us the way that we want to do work differently or consider work being done differently in the future? Is you, if your systems are connected to one another, so if your performance and your compensation and your reward system are tied to, let's say, payroll, um, then you don't have to do double entry. So if those systems talk to one another, either they're a, a native system that's already all built on the same platform, or you do that through integrations. So let's say your succession management software is a third-party vendor. That's fine. 
Um, you use your core HR performance rewards, and then you can connect that with succession. And the reason that you want that data to flow um, both ways, if you will, is so that you don't have to do double entry, triple entry, quadruple entry of that data. And uh, that's where errors happen. That's why it's important to tie a lot of things to core HR, uh, payroll benefit, and, and HRIS is so that you just don't have to actually type it anymore. And, and, you, and it reduces errors, which reduces mistakes. Mistakes kind of make it a better experience, not just for the people operating those systems, of course, but for all employees and how it impacts the employee experience. If we make less mistakes on the back end, they never see it. They don't even know that it's there, but they know when it doesn't work. And that's, that's, if you think of HRS and if you think of HR software in that way, it's like electricity in your house or plumbing in your house, you're not really thinking about it on a day-to-day -day basis. You only think about it when it doesn't work. So that's why integration's great, but data flow and workflow, uh, you can fix the workflow part with processes. You want that data to flow easily in between applications, whatever applications there are. Absolutely. And uh, I think, you know, uh, there are uh, another, rec I'm sure you agree that recruitment now is going to change, right? I mean, uh, it has to be more tech related, tech oriented. So do you think yeah. that, uh, you know, chatbots will really make a difference? And, you know, chatbots versus high touch experience? What is your opinion? Well, I think what, well, first of all, the, you can't take the human and you shouldn't take the human experience out of recruiting because humans want some, both, both as candidates and as recruiters and hiring managers, they, there's going to be a human element where, where bots, machine learning and AI kind of all can help is making things more efficient for both parties. So a bot, let's just take that as a simple example. A bot can ask clarifying question. Uh, questions and answer clar clarifying questions. So imagine the, the job is uh, you know, a front-end developer. And what you really want in that front-end developer is you want 10 years of experience, but you want to have them to have, have at least five different experiences, you know, at five different places or five different experiences, even at the same spot. Okay, so, and you want them to have a degree in computer science. For whatever reason, that's just a, something that's important to the hiring manager. Okay, so a bot can actually take you through that. Hey, how are you doing? Um, you know, are you being safe? Great. Um, let me ask you a couple of quick questions, and you ask me questions as well. Um, do, you have, do you have a degree? Do you have a bachelor's degree in computer science? You know, where from? When did you graduate? Do you have an idea, a uh, rough idea of your GPA at the time? You know, great. Um, you, you says that you, you're a front-end developer. Your resume, your profile, et cetera, says that you're a front-end developer. That's fantastic. How long have you been doing that? So like a bot can ask, just as a recruiter would ask, all of these clarifying questions that are important to the hiring manager, and to the role description, to the job description. And, and they can also flip that for the experience for the candidate. They can answer a bunch of questions. So as a candidate, uh, uh, do you do matching? Um, can, can I roll my 401k into this, that, or the other? Uh, like like you, a candidate can and, and does uh, ask all kinds of crazy questions. You know, who's my boss? What do they like? Uh, is it a big team? Is it a small team? Have they worked remotely for a long time? Like a candidate can ask all those questions and the bot can answer those uh, questions as well. And what's great is if, if the person's not qualified, if the candidate's not qualified, you can imagine experience at that point that the bot can then say, listen, based on everything you've told me, uh, and we'll clarify just in case I, I got something wrong, based on what you've told me, you're not qualified for this position because of this. The, the hiring manager wants, uh, out of your 10 years of experience, five different dis, dis, uh, bespoke, if you will, or different experiences uh, within those 10 years. And it sounds like you've been doing, in that 10 years, the same front-end development, which is fantastic. You've gone deep, but they, they want a little bit more variety. So you're, you're not... 
you're not qualified in their mind for this position. However, you know, within the ATS, your data is going to stay live unless you prefer it not to be. And then when recruiters search for another front end developer, they might have different requirements. So that can all be done with a, a bot. Like I, we didn't do anything difficult there. Um, but now what's, what's, what's good about that for two, two or three different reasons. A, recruiters only are getting people that are really qualified for the job. So there's a purity in the flow, in the flow of what comes through to them. You know, the, the, they are dealing with people that already hit all the requirements for the hiring manager. Let's say the hiring manager has 10 different requirements, and maybe even you, you've prioritized those 10. You can ask all of those questions in a bot, and you've got a record of that that, that, that actually everyone can look at that sticks inside of the ATS. So you can always go back and refer to that data. Um, and if a person's not qualified, or if they are qualified, so let's deal with they're not qualified. Um, they know right then. There's not a two weeks later. Um, we're gonna we're gonna uh, keep the position open. We're gonna get back to you. There's none of that stuff. It's you know where you stand immediately as a candidate, which I think is uh, as a candidate, I think is a fantastic thing because I'd rather know um, if I've applied to a job at Facebook and I go through this process. I'd rather know right then. Do I have a chance or is this a no? If it's a no. Okay, I move on to the next thing. Um, if it's if it's not, then you can create a different experience for the candidate. Let's say that, hey, listen, well, we've asked all the clarifying questions, and you've we've also answered some questions. You seem like a good fit for this. You're going to go to the next phase. Okay, so the next phase is a skills testing assessment. So here's what that means: you're going to take an hour long test. And it's going to be, it's, it's administrated uh, by this company. It's objective. Uh, you're only going to have it for 60 minutes. And, uh, and it's going to ask you a bunch of probative skills-related questions. So now that you've answered with well, the way that we, we wanted you to, now we're going to really go fact check that and make sure that you actually have the skills that we require. Was well, a candidate, again, I'm not intimidated by a test. Um, I, and I know where I'm going. I know where in the process that I started, uh, questions have been asked and answered, and now I'm going to go do a skills test. And if I pass the skills test, then there'll be the next step, whatever that is, behavioral assessment, personality assessment. And then by the time you get where there's the human interaction, the recruiter can then bait, take everything and go, listen, You've, you've, you've passed the behavioral test. You've passed the skills test. You've passed the personality test. Um, looks like you are a fantastic fit. Let's schedule a time for us to talk. Now you bring the human element back into it where you're only dealing with, recruiters are only dealing with people that are really hyper-qualified for the job, and they can go deeper. And that's the real upside is with all of these technologies, you've gained this efficiency and so what do you do with that efficiency? You, be more, you, you become more human. And as you become more human, you then can go deeper with candidates, you know, in, in much the same way. You just go deeper with them. And, uh, and I think that's what these technologies kind of can help. They're not replacing jobs. They're not replacing recruiters. If anything, they're actually helping recruiters to become more efficient with qualified, highly qualified candidates. Long-winded answer. Sorry about that, but that's essentially how you'd use those technologies. The tests still have to get done. Like we, if, you're, if your process is, you know, especially if a hiring manager is giving you kind of the 10 different things and you, and you really kind of delve into those, um, those things have to be asked. Those questions have to be asked and answered. And uh, as it relates to skills, um, or behavioral assessments or personality assessments. Again, there's like 80,000 different things that you could add to this. But the idea is those things still have to happen. It's now what you can do with bots is it's more wayfinding. It's almost like, like you know, like every, every you know, application you've ever, you know, uh, take, take uh, Google Maps, for instance. Like, remember, if you can re remember a world before Google Maps, which I can, and, and I'm so glad that Google Maps is, is here, or a, a world before Siri, 
you know, where you would just ask a question out of the out of in thin air, and then an answer would come back. People are okay with interacting with bots. It's actually okay to tell people it's a recruitment bot that's been programmed to ask you a bunch of questions that we would ask you. So, you know, um, but those, those, there's the, the thing that folks need to remember is those questions have to be asked and answered on both sides, both us of candidates and candidates of us. So this is just an, an, a way to make that more efficient and also flow through and wayfinding, like here's the next steps. For those that go forward, here are the next five steps. Let's start with step one. And then take them through the next five steps if they pass. I mean, that's the thing. That's what we know on the, how this, as we've done it traditionally, if they don't pass the behavioral assessment, they don't move forward. Period. End of story. Now, now what we're doing is we're letting them know that and more in real time, it's like, hey, your personality uh, is just not a great fit for the team. So the team dynamic has one thing, and you're in conflict with that dynamic. You're, you're, you're a good person. It has nothing to do with you and everything to do with the team dynamic, and you're just not a great fit. So we're going to pass now. So this, this job is no longer viable for you at this moment. But your data, and our, our recruiters always check the ATS first, for hires because it's there it's already data there like you can explain to them in a very humane way that yeah you're not going forward it's it's okay like not not all the salmon make it up up the stream right so you're not going to go forward however this just might not have been the right job for you we might find another job next week or next month next year so if we do find a good job or a good fit for you we'd like to be able to reach out to you and then advance those discussions if you're okay with that. But as a candidate, what, what's great about it is I know right then, okay, this job's, this job's not going to happen. I don't have to think about it tonight. I don't have to think about it tomorrow. I don't have to ponder it uh, and worry about it. I have kind of definitive uh, knowledge of this isn't going to move forward. Okay, I can deal with that. As a candidate, Candidates can, you don't have to treat them like with porcelain, as porcelain. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it's one of those deals, you know. Um, I think they would rather you just tell them the truth and so that they know what's going on rather than not. And I think we've, we've hidden from that for a long time. Uh, and we've hidden behind behind maybe workflow or process or maybe because we're so busy, et cetera. But I think the faster you can let a candidate know where they stand, the better for them, the better experience for them, and the better for you. Absolutely. I think it also reduces anxiety, uh, you know, that a lot of candidates might be having. A hundred percent. And it's anxiety that we don't really deal with. We let the candidates kind of deal with by themselves. They just kind of, you know, they're just anxiously awaiting like a response. And what, whatever the response is, it's okay. They'll deal with it. But there's just something. Tell me something. And I, you hear that uh, candidates will tell you that time and time and time and time again. Just tell me. I, I mean, I can deal with bad news. Just let me know. And and I think this is using, you know, using bots, again, machine learning, AI, using these types of technologies to help candidates have a better experience and, and also create efficiency for yourself so that you can go deeper. Um, the efficiency thing, uh, I'll deal with that for just a second. What that really allows you to do as a recruiter and a hiring manager is spend more time with the candidates so that you really make a great hiring decision. Uh, the opposite is that you make quick decisions. You don't have enough time. So you run the risk of making a bad hire. And, and bad hires are, I mean, they can set an organization back. You know, one bad hire can can ruin a team. It could create a turnover and not only just you know ruin the project, but it can ruin all kinds of things. So if we flip that and we're more efficient on the front side, we give ourselves more time to then go deep with the candidate and just go, you know what, we're going to spend three hours together. You know, normally we would have had a 30 minute interview, but now what we're going to do is we're going to, as a team, 
spend three hours together and we're just going to bat around ideas and we're going to get to see how you think and you're going to get to see how we think and you get to make a, an informed decision if this is a good team for you or if this is a, a intellectually challenging problem for you etc so we can actually do that if we have time and it's once again a better experience for the candidate because you know what if what if they're also nervous about, hey, this looks like a really good, a really good opportunity. I, I think this would be a really good fit, but they don't know. You know, the more time we can kind of give them more insight into the job, the team, the boss, the, uh, you know, the company, the culture, all of that stuff, the more they can make an informed decision uh, on whether or not that's a good place for them and a, and a, and a good time for them, etc. So I think I think these efficiency tools really, you know, they they help everywhere in the process. They help the candidate have a better experience. They help recruiters have a better experience and more time, better efficiency, you know, let people know where they're at in the process. Like there's a million different ways to cut that these are actually helpful. And lastly, on this, on this particular point, because of the consumerization of bots, I mean, I mentioned Siri earlier, but we're all dealing with bots. And we're okay with it. Like every, almost every website we go to, we shop, there's a bot there that pops up and says, Hey, you know what? I've seen that you, you know, that you've looked at these things over here. You, we have a sale on these other things over here. You might want to look at like that. That's a bot. Like we all are comfortable with that now. Maybe 10 years ago, we weren't. Uh, and for some of us, maybe five years ago, we weren't. But now, like you interact with a bot all the time, almost on every website, there's a bot. So that's the consumerization of the technology is, is helpful for recruiters. It's helpful for us. And, and if you want to take that internal, the organization, we used to call this uh, employee self-service where uh, essentially HR would, would house um, a bunch of different files, uh, maybe the health insurance files or, or whatever it is, the sexual harassment policy, whatever. Um, and we would say employee self-service. So if you needed to find something, instead of calling us or emailing us, just go to the portal and then go find the things that you need. Well, now on the front end of those portals, shocking, there's a bot. You know, that basically sits there then says, what do you need? What are you looking for? I need to find the health insurance plan or the most up-to-date uh, health insurance plan. My, my son needs to go to uh, occupational therapy, and I don't know if it's covered. Uh, here's the plan, by the way, occupational, is, occupational therapy is covered. In, in your case, it's for 40 visits a year. Like, you've just answered my question, and we didn't call HR. Now... The beauty of that is now you've given HR time to actually do the things that HR wants to do. Right. And so, again, the efficient, same, same concept. We've just moved it further back into the employee experience, not the candidate experience. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, if the chatbot can just answer my questions in a second or two, then I, why, well, why won't I just, you know, just take that option? I just do that. Yeah, it's it's an easier it's an easier way to interact and get the answers. I think that's the 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 thing that uh that, that again you're you're trying to get questions answered, and as you're trying to get questions answered, uh, as an employee, you want both the quality of the answer and the speed of the answer, right? So you're you know I emailed HR. I mean this is years ago. But I emailed HR. I still haven't heard back from. Them. I don't know what's going on. Well, a bot can mitigate all of that. And I think you said you said something earlier that's really important to highlight: um, anxiety. Uh, we all have anxieties. So let's just kind of get over the, the the fact that it's not like one person has anxiety. Everyone has anxieties. Uh, candidates have anxieties. Those are it's different. Employees have anxieties. Those are different. And if a bot can help them get to a document and help them uh, maybe answer a question that they have, but a lot of these questions that, that I would tell you that are maybe benefits related, those are easy to load up in a bot. And they're easy to have, uh, can I see this doctor? It's out of network. So the question is twofold. Can I see them? And if so, what does it cost? Like all of that stuff can be answered. Like we don't have to call HR. 
And we don't really even have to log into a portal per se, other than to get to the chatbot. But you can even imagine where that chatbot doesn't reside in a portal. It resides just maybe on your desktop when you open up the application. And anytime you want to ask it a question about, hey, when, when's my next performance review? You know, it's uh, Monday, the 21st of May. Okay, cool. You know, like, you know, you can ask the bot anything employee related, and the bot should be able to tell you those things. Right. HR, HR software sh should uh, never be seen and just be heard. And it should, it should be seamless, not just in the way that it flows and data and those types of things, but in the way that it answers your questions. Because we all have HR questions. I have HR questions. You have HR questions. Everyone that would ever listen to this uh, uh, show would, is going to have an HR question. Uh, maybe today, maybe tomorrow. And those questions need to get answered uh, uh, at, a, at a high quality level, accurate level. Uh, so accuracy is important uh, and speed is important. And instead of bogging down people that are in HR, we don't have to do that. We can, we can actually do that in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. But, but you know what, William, there are, there are so many you know, uh, tech tools out there and just so many of them claim to have you know, like these different features. How do you how do you really decide what's best for your organization? Well, the the first thing you do is real simple. You you um, you look at your own priorities and say, what are we solving for? And so, what's what's the the most important thing that we're solving for? And then, as you evaluate, you know, technologies, you only evaluate the things that you really need, not necessarily what other people are doing, not necessarily what other people are trying to sell you, but what is the real need that you have? And uh, evaluating technology, in, in, you're right, there's a lot of options. So take you know, an LMS. There's hundreds, maybe potentially even thousands of different LMSs or people that do that type of work, maybe even content providers, et cetera. Um, so in looking at it, one of the things I tell folks to do is, is always talk to your peers. Um, so the first thing I would do is just talk to a couple of your peers and say, we're looking at a new LMS. What experiences you have you had good, bad, or otherwise, but what other, what other, what have experiences have you had? Then they can then shed some light. Great. Then go and look at rating sites, rating sites. In this case, uh, G2 software advice, uh, Keptera, there's a, there's a, not hundreds, but there's a lot of great rating sites out there for software. And look at people's experience with the software. And you're going to find, a, again, you're going to find, it's like a restaurant. You know, a restaurant might have 200,000 experiences in a year. Some of those are going to be bad. Some of those, most of those are going to be good. So you're looking at uh, probably an 80, 80, 20, 30, 70 type of split where you see content that's positive and some content that where people maybe didn't have a great experience. Okay. Third thing you do is you look at Glassdoor and look at how employees of that company view their own company, uh, past and present employees, how they view their CEO, et cetera. And, uh, and, and at that point, you're, you're ready, in my opinion, you're ready to build a short list based on just some of the data things, data that you know. And then that short list should be about 10 different plays. And what you want to do with those is treat them all the exact same. So create kind of a baseline of we're going to go and do an hour-long demo, not an hour and 15, not an hour and a half, not 30 minutes, hour-long demo. Here's the team, and we're going to do it with these 10 proprietors. And everyone grades out what they saw, what they experienced, questions that got they asked, questions that got answered, uh, et cetera. And you're not really looking at price at this point, right? Uh, all too often, people rush to price. Uh, I suggest that you, you're going to get to price. Trust me, uh, it is inevitable that you will get to price. Right now, get the, get the features and functionality that makes sense for what you're trying to achieve. Nail that first. Make sure that you're not buying features that you're not going to use. Make sure that it's resolving the pain or the problem that you're trying to get it to resolve. Um, th those things have to happen first. Then, uh, after you have the 10, take the 10 and vote that down to three. 
And uh, what you want to do with the three vendors, you want to go deeper, just like a candidate. I mean, what's funny is we're kind of talking about the recruiting process a second ago, and we're essentially using some of the same tactics. So get it down to three and go deeper. Uh, maybe invite them on site if you want to do that. Um, have a deeper meeting. Like, okay, r- r- let them know more of the situation. Here's our payroll. Uh, here's our you know performance management. You know, here's these different systems, et cetera. Uh, because at one point, you're going to care more about workflow and the flow of data. And so try to see what fits you the best. Yeah. And at that point, again, you're kind of voting, you're kind of voting, you know, what you like in the best of the three. And at that point, you can open up a financial discussion and go, okay, all three, all graded out really well. Have we have three wonderful options? Now what? And now you can have a how many years is the contract? What's the you know price of the contract? Is it PEPM? Is it usage based? Like what what are the different economic models? Um, what's the implementation cost if there is so? Integrations? Is there any integration costs? Like you can go deeper into the economics, uh, if you will, um, before you sign anything. But yeah, you can take thousands of software and whittle it down more quickly than you think. If you if you're if you're rigorous on the front end of looking at what's out there, and then really looking them up and going deep in your kind of your research, if you will, and and then going deeper into those team interviews of you know not just one person looking at the software. That's always a fail. Uh, have a team of people looking at software, uh, an entire conference room. And if you do it through Zoom, do the you know a Zoom conference where ten different people are looking at the same screen. And then after that, you have a kind of a post review where you're all talking about, okay, here's what I saw, here's what I saw, here's what I saw, here's my notes on this. I give them a grade of, and then you know, create a grading system. Uh, but yeah, you can navigate that world. I always start um, with practitioners asking practitioners, ask your peer group, ask, I mean, I mean, this is one of those things that you can use Facebook or LinkedIn or, or just email and, and you, every HR professional and every recruiting professional has a network of peers. So this is a simple question. You know, we're thinking about purchasing X I'm open for any suggestions. And again, good, bad, or otherwise. Love to hear your experience. You might say that you had a bad experience with a vendor, and that might be the vendor that we end up choosing. That's okay. That's okay because it might have been bad for that other uh, person or that uh, your peer, but it might be a perfect fit for you. So that's, that's how you take that large swath of software and bring it down to something that's manageable. And the reason that, that you get the team involved is more often than not, they're the ones that are going to be in the software the most. You know, there's, there's a difference between the economic buyer, sometimes the admin or super users, and then the people that use it day in and day out. You really want all of those people uh, as best you can. You want all of those people in the room. They're going to ask different questions like a, like an admin is going to ask admin-related questions. A user is going to ask user-related questions, and a buyer that maybe never logs into that system is going to ask buying-related questions, all of which are important. And again, you know, you're not you're not trying to save, you know, all of those things for the last thing. I just, I, I, my advice to folks on price is don't rush to price. Get to price. But first of all, make sure that you have solved for whatever pain uh, that you're trying to solve for first and make sure that the solution does what it says that it's supposed to do. And, um, and then once you get past that, then, then you, you're, you're going to talk about price. No one's signing a contract at, you know, without talking about price. So you're going to get to price. I promise it'll happen. Uh, but you don't need to start there. And you shouldn't start there. Right. And so, you know, what, what is the perfect sales demo for you? The perfect sales demo for me is um, live software. So I'm not looking at a, um, I'm not looking at a PowerPoint. I'm not looking at some type of Camtasia where they're showing me something uh, 
you know, that's that's really scripted. Um, I, a perfect demo for me is where they've gotten permission from one of their clients to crack open their their software, or their their instance, and show you how they use it, because you you can't hide anything then. You know, you can hide things in PowerPoint. You can hide things in a a a, a polished demo, sales demo. You can hide things in a polished Camtasia video where they take you through the software. You can't hide things, or it's very hard for you to hide things in live software. So my best and my favorite, again, advice I, I give to practitioners almost every day is look at live software because it cuts out all of the you know, uh, the potential for someone to say that they have something and they don't actually have it. It's, all, it's being worked on and, it, and it'll be live maybe next month, but it's not there now. And it's so easy um, uh, for a marketer or a product person or a salesperson at a vendor to say that they have it because they know that it's, in, it's being beta tested right now and that 100 customers are using it but it's not live yet. And what you as a buyer want to know is the difference between is it being beta tested? Is it being alpha tested? Is it on the roadmap? Will it be developed this year? As opposed to are people using it right now? And that's with every feature and function uh, that you care about. And so live software, as much as you can get into live software, the better. Right. And you know, have you seen like um, you know any particular feature that that customers really really want? And I think HR systems kind of miss out on that. Um, actually, what's funny is it's um, it's training related. It's features inside the application that helps you in the application. So, say it's performance review software, and inside the application, it gives you training. Hey, you haven't done a performance review in, in you know in a year or in six months or whatever. You here's how to go back through that. So here are the important questions to ask. Here's the important questions that you want to answer, etc. It's in application help, support, training. So you don't have to go to a help box and go to the internet or, or go to YouTube or go to a user community. You don't have to go to LinkedIn. You don't have to go find something somewhere else or God forbid, go to the vendor's website and search for things. It's inside the application and it's where you need it. And why that's important is that it's at the point of need. And like we said, with performance reviews, I'm trying to figure something out because I, Sally her review's coming up next week, and I haven't done a performance review in six months. I've, I've actually forgotten, you know, how to do a performance review. I need a, quick, I need a quick video that shows me what to do, how to do it. And so it's at that point of need, and it's not pushing them off to something else or somewhere else. It's answering that question when they need it and where they need it. That's the feature that's the most important. And the more vendors that do that, they make a better experience for all employees um, because it's in application. They don't have to go somewhere else to get that information. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense actually because you kind of solve the problem right then and there. And that also brings me to the question that, you know, user interface, uh, mm -hmm. you know, let's admit it, all legacy systems, they are very complex to use and they just take too much time, you know, doing just simple tasks. So UI, how, how do we solve the problem of a simple, intuitive UI? Well, there's, there's three things. So there's UI, UX, and UA. And, and so when people think of it, UI, so that you understand kind of is user interface. It's how you interface with the software, well, be it on your phone, a tablet, your desktop, you know, however, your TV. Um, you... X is your user experience. And so that's how you travail the software. Is it one click? Is it two clicks? Is it 92 clicks? Uh, is it easy to find, etc.? And the UA is user adoption. All three of those things are important to you when you look at software and as you purchase software. Um, the intuitiveness of, of uh, software is, is, you know, one person's intuitiveness is not necessarily another person's intuitiveness. So let's, let's not make statements like it's just intuitive for everybody um, because that's not necessarily true. So the first thing is, is you, that's, this is why you do a lot of demos and you look at a lot, a lot of software is 
can I answer the questions without asking the questions? That's, in, that's intuitive. I mean, if you think of the intuitive as a word, it's someone expecting that you need something before you know you need it. That's intuitiveness. So, so is the software intuitive? If you can look at it and travail and look like it's set up in a way that organizationally it makes sense to you, the pull downs or the drop downs or the click throughs makes sense to you. And that's what that's the, I'm, I'm, I'm careful with my words here because the make sense is what intuition is about. It's got to make sense to you. If it doesn't make sense to you, then it's not intuitive. And, and, and possibly they have a UI problem. And that's why you want frontline users testing the software. Because you don't want to buy software that you think is intuitive and get in a five-year contract, and then all of a sudden your frontline users use it and go, I, 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 this thing's terrible. I, I don't even know where to start. So there, there's a real reason that you, you look at UI um, uh, and UX and UA, and you think about these things carefully, and you solve for them. Because getting back to that scenario where we whittle the firms down to 10, down to 3, et cetera, once we're down to three, we might find one system is just, it has a better UI. It's just everyone feels like it really is intuitive to their questions. Um, and their UX is really also very easy. They can find things and click through things and get to the reporting that they need to uh, in a way that's easy for them. The help uh, function is easy to navigate. Like it's, Stuff like that that we kind of forget, but we need to also think about software, HR software, as a part of the employee experience. So you're logging into HR software every day, and if you're having a bad experience with that software, you might love your job, but hate the software that you're using. And, and thusly, that actually impacts your employee experience. So there's a real reason, it's a great question, and there's a real reason to make sure that the UI, the UX, and the UA, that you think about these things as you're purchasing software. The, in software, all software, not just HR recruiting software, but all software suffers from what's called feature bloat, meaning there's features within a system for a client that they don't use, that maybe they never needed, and maybe were, should have never been developed. Okay, we'll put all that stuff aside, but you only look at the features that you're going to use. Because those are the only ones that really matter. Um, and so a rich feature set sounds great. So let me give you an example. Uh, I'm going to sell you, I'm going to sell you a global payroll system. And at one point I'm going to tell you, you can do, you have 130,000 130, employees all around the world. You can do global payroll from your iPhone. Now that sounds fantastic, right? Like I can do 100,000, 130,000 employees, global payroll from my iPhone. Sounds fantastic. Up into the point where you actually think about it and go, why would I ever, in, in any case or scenario, do global payroll for 100, 130,000 employees across the world on my phone? It would never happen. So that's a feature that's positioned as a feature, but it's not a feature because you're never going to use it. So... Uh, when you say a rich feature set, really draw circles around the ones that you know you're going to use. Those are the rich features. All that other stuff, it's, it's cannon fodder. You're not going to use it, and thusly, it's not rich features. Uh, and then you ask to whether, you know, whether or not you prioritize, you got to get your features first. You got to get the things that you know that you need to get done. Those are I mean, you have to have that. It doesn't, doesn't matter how intuitive the software is if it doesn't do the things that you need to get done. So features do trump UI, UX, and UA on some level because it's got to do the things that you need it to do. And only the things that you need it to do. So I, I tend to take a really hard position on features that it's not a feature. And in fact, it's, it's, that's a sales word and a marketing word. Uh, it's not a feature unless people use it. And if people don't use it, it's not a feature. It might it might be something that you've put into the software, but if people don't find it important and they don't use it, 
then uh, then it's not a feature. I like performance based uh, recruiting because it sets the bar. And, and I've known Lou for uh, you know 170 years, uh, and he's one of the smartest guys on the planet about this stuff. Um, I like it because it keeps the emphasis on making sure that you're hiring great people and not just filling roles. Right, you're filling the 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 role with the right person that's going to kind of quickly make an impact on the organization, stay there a long time, and do a great job. And and so performance base is not just about like you have 40 open positions and I got to fill them as fast as possible. So it makes the recruiter really think about you know things that they don't normally think about post hire how that person's going to thrive. And uh, I'd rather make have the conversation with recruiters that, you know what, if it takes us another month of an open position, but we get the, the right person, I'd rather get the right person than the wrong person and start this process all over again. So I, I actually, I 100% agree with Lou on performance-based uh, recruiting. And it just, it aligns interest and it aligns uh, incentives and it aligns all of our thinking to the same thing. And that 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 in and of itself is smart because now we're not working against each other. Now we're not now we don't have different, you know, we don't have a conflict of of interest, if you will. Yeah, and it's like it's solid, robust data that you can depend on. Uh, right. you know, and, and just really, really uh, be satisfied that yeah, you know, this is gonna be the best talent for my organization. Yeah, I think right. it makes sense. Right. Yep. Um, so, you know, I'm just going to boil down to the last question. It's been sure. the last question. If, you know, if you have any other important sound bites that you'd like to leave for our viewers, that would really be great. Yeah, I think, you know, for me, when you evaluate software, first of all, you know, give yourself a break um, and cut yourself a little bit of a slack. Again, you mentioned it uh, early in the show that you know people have anxiety, candidates have anxiety. Well, you know what? Buying software is riddled with anxiety. And we don't talk about it enough that when you buy software, you're also making a big choice for the organization, for the users, for yourself. And so there's a lot of anxiety technically in buying software. And making quote unquote the right choice, and so if if you make a bad pick, um, try to try to try to try to leverage it as best you can, but also I, I think forgive yourself if you make a bad pick, and uh, you know the goal is obviously like with hiring that you don't make a bad pick, but it's also true that occasionally you fall in love with the software, it checks everything off the box, everyone graded it out, price was right, you implement it, and two years later, people hate it. And, uh, and that happens, happens every day. And so what I would say in that is, A, that, that you can fix that. Um, and there's a couple ways to fix that. You can bring in a consultant, you can bring in someone from the company that sold you the software to optimize and help you kind of fix the things that are broken, if you will. Most of those things are probably going to be process related. Um, and then the other side of it is give yourself a break. Like, like, okay, you made a bad choice. Like it's, you know, it's Okay. Um, and, 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 and so you should kind of think about that when you're purchasing, it's like, Hey, we're going to make the best purchase based on the best data that we can. We're all going to be in agreement. And if two years down the road, this isn't the best software, we'll hire somebody, we'll bring somebody in, we'll do something to kind of get through the contract and then we'll make a different purchasing decision, you know, but give yourself a break. I think that, that sometimes there's a lot of guilt, uh, a lot of anxiety and a lot of shame for uh, making a bad purchasing decision. And uh, I, I don't suggest that any, anybody has any of that stuff. Recognize it for what it was. You made the best decision at that time that you could. And, uh, and everyone was in agreement. And uh, you know, two or three years down the road, it, for whatever reason, it just doesn't fit you anymore. Okay. You know, it's like buying a house. 
you know, you buy a house uh, and then, uh, you know, with the best intentions of living there, maybe all your life. Um, and then all of a sudden you have seven kids and, uh, you know, that house, you know, I don't have seven kids. I have two, uh, but you have seven kids. Well, you know what? It was the best intentions at the time that you made that decision. It was a great decision at the time. Now that you have seven kids, first of all, why you have seven kids, but okay, you have seven kids, that house is no longer a great fit for you. Your circumstances has changed. Don't have any guilt. Don't have any anxiety. Don't have any shame. It's like things have changed. And we're going to now go make another purchasing decision, a new house. And now, now that we know that we have seven kids, we'll you know, plan accordingly and we'll buy accordingly. So my advice there that I haven't already talked through is just ease back on yourself and relax a little bit, have fun in the process. Don't less, you know, lower some of that anxiety and lessen some of that guilt and shame. And, and yet purchases are made every day. So imagine all of that, you know, all of the complexity that's going on with people that's behind the scenes, they've got that anxiety, they've got all that stuff that they've got to now go and wrestle with. And most of them are doing it alone. That's, that's another part that's, that's also difficult is they're not doing it with a team. And uh, again, get the, getting that economic buyer, the admins, the users, getting a bunch of those people together to where it's a shared decision. We're making the best decision as a team together. And again, we might get it wrong. We yeah. might get it wrong. And if we do, we'll figure that out as that time comes. We'll figure that out. But it also, if you, if you do it with a team, it helps you because now, now not all that pressure is on you per se. It's on the team of which you're a member to make a good decision. And you're going to make the best decision you can make with the data that you have and with the agreement that you have with everybody in the room. And, and hopefully you, it works out, but sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an important lesson to everyone out there uh, to not feel guilty and kind of, you know, get weighed down by the burden. Uh, sure. I, I, you know, that's great advice. And I think you've just reduced anxiety for a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it was a pleasure talking to you, William. I had a lovely time. I think you spoke a lot about so many things and I've learned so many things through this conversation. Uh, I really appreciate your time and sharing your views with us. It's been an enriching learning experience for me personally and will surely be for our viewers too. So thank you so much, and I'd love to stay in touch with you. Well, I've had a wonderful time myself. I appreciate you asking, um, and I hope that uh, I hope that people have learned something. And if you need any help, both you uh, and anybody that watches the, the video, if you have any questions, reach out. Happy to help out. Uh, that would be amazing. Thank you so much, William, and take care of yourself. You too. Take care of yourself. Take care of your family, especially during these times. Appreciate you. Yes, absolutely.